Welcome and welcome back everybody to the OK Grognard Show. Today is Monday, August 22nd, 2022, 10 a.m. Central in beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So what do we got going on today? We're continuing magic items. This is part 11. Last week we did the tables for rods, staffs, and wands. And now we are going to get into the descriptions. This is all, of course, from the first edition Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide. So you probably guessed that already. Anywho, we should jump right in. It's going to be a quick one probably today. I've got some other things to do and I can't dawdle. Anyway, rods at all, including staves and wands. So there you go. Rods are about three foot long and as thick as your thumb. Staves about five to six feet long and as thick as a young sapling. About an inch and a half at the base, tapering to an inch at the tip. Although they can be of nearly any equal diameter, knurled, etc. Wands are about a foot and a quarter long. What's that? 15 inches. Long and slender rods are fashioned from metal, strange wood, ivory, or bone. They can be plain or decorated and carved, tipped or not. Staves are typically fashioned of wood, often carved, usually metal bound and shod and likely to be gnarled and twisted. They could be unusual or appear to be ordinary. Wands are of ivory, bone, or wood and usually tipped with something, metal, crystal, stone, etc. They're fragile and tend to break easily. Rods and wands will usually be found in cases or similar storage places. Staves stand sturdily alone. In neither case is concealment precluded, of course. So this is to say that uh, one does not have to openly brandish these uh, magic user or otherwise weapons of choice. You know, the, uh, the description on staves being five or six feet defies some depiction from fantasy literature where a stave will often be held about head high the hand on the stave about on the staff about as high as the ear of the uh, wizard and extending above their head unless they're five footish tall then it would suggest that the staffs, a staff can be taller, longer. It does say usually, so maybe there's just a a uh, penchant to make them seem more formidable, more powerful. Also, too, the tapering off as it gets taller, rather than the gnarled head of the staff that you often see depicted in fantasy artwork seems to be the opposite rods i don't know that we see a lot of rods in fantasy artwork i can't uh, off the top of my head recall any major literature with illustrations or even just written uh, and i don't read all literature i'm talking more classic stuff uh, you know arthurian legend and Tolkien and earlier rather than more recent, so there may be any number of depictions, uh, literary depictions, where there are folks with rods. Of course, wands, incredibly popular, especially uh, with the uh, advent of Harry Potter. Seems like uh, all the wizards wind up with a wand in those 
They don't seem as fragile as seems to be mentioned here. They are fragile and tend to break easily, is the quote. But they are uh, cared for and they are uh, fashioned. Wasn't that part of the deal that they they make them themselves as part of their training? So you can incorporate that into a campaign for sure. Is uh, some sort of a ability to, or a rite of passage, where one creates one's own. There's a uh, tradition, and it's older. It may not still be something that happens these days, where carpenters, apprentice carpenters, would eventually be tasked with fashioning their own toolbox, whether it was a simple box with a open top box with a handle across for heavier tools they're usually pretty solid or uh, something more formidable uh, was a tradition for a uh, an apprentice before they become a journeyman to make a toolbox and uh, this is something you can incorporate into magic users progressing and becoming more powerful the cases for the tool for the uh, wands or rods perhaps that's the way to go if you want to say that wands and rods themselves are too powerful to be made by lower level wizards perhaps making their own case for their wand or a rod or or their master's wand or rod or mistress's wand or rod is a task they perform as they uh, level up. I don't know if you want to do it before they get to first level or if you want to say before they get to third, before they get to fifth. Maybe that's too far along. To continue with the text, though, Unless noted to the contrary, these items will have the following number of charges. Each time the item is used, there is an expenditure of one charge. The user will not necessarily be aware of the number of charges in an item. Let's be clear. Some of these devices use multiple charges. Have moat their modal. They have multiple ways of using them and Perhaps the baseline way costs one charge, but then more powerful ways can expend more charges. So let's throw that in. It says on rods, 50 charges minus 0 to 9. That's a D10 minus 1. For staves, 25 charges minus 0 to 5. That's a D6 minus 1. 100 charges for wands minus 0 to 19. That's a D20 minus 1. Yeah, I missed a little note in here. Sarah says, uh, Grognard the second Dresden had a blasting rod, but he is newer. Well, you know, I did watch some of the Dresden shows, but I didn't read the books. I knew he used a hockey stick as a stave, as a staff, yeah. But uh, perhaps I uh, missed out on some of the more details, like uh, using a blasting rod. Was that something you used often, I'll ask you? Uh, or was that something that was uh, shown in, in one chapter of a book, in one instance, one adventure? And then wasn't used again. One of his many things. I knew he had a room full of like artifacts and stuff. Anyway, I'll continue, but uh, do answer that if you do. If you do know. Uh, after the charges, most of these items can be recharged by spell users of a sufficiently high level. This is discussed elsewhere under the heading "Fabrication of Magic Items." Note that a rod, staff, or wand completely drained will become useless forever, crumbling to power, powder as its last charge is expended. 
you can uh, take that to heart or not. It seems um, seems sad to uh, have an item go out of the world. And, you know, if you don't know how many charges there are, maybe that's one of the exciting things about having having that. Now, I will note that, as we talked about last week a little bit uh, with George, uh, I will often throw in some of the less powerful items into a treasure with only a handful of charges or a few charges uh, for a lower level group where a fully charged even 50 or 100 or less the minus uh, would be too powerful for a campaign at low levels um, I'll throw one in with one or two charges sometimes just because I know that it's going to be useful in the instance where uh, you know in a pinch and not something they're going to be you know like a magic uh, a fully charged magic missile wand where they're just firing it off in every encounter that might be a little overkill for a first level or second level character in a first or second level group even third I'll continue use of rods staves and wands any device of this nature which discharges some form of magic over a distance that is the device that does not require touch or contact with the object or creature to be affected must generally have a command word spoken in order to cause the device to function thus a wand of lightning for example might require the utterance of the keyword blitzen in order to discharge or it might have a key phrase to cause it to function such as what an ampere volted ohm possibly even extending to let this discharge find its home oh goody a rhyming couplet that is the way to go Gary a wand of polymorphing or other similar device performing a like function would require a keyword and the new form to be made by the power. That's the word. Be a bird. Or is it zots? I think it's zots. Or some such. Magical silence will mostly... Magical silence will most certainly prevent such devices from functioning. Parenthetically, it says, see also, use of magic items, command words, close parentheses. We get into individual rods after this. And uh, I'm going to let this be a short show, about half as long as normal. But let's address Sarah's response. Never watched the show, but was his go-to in books. Oh, the rod was his go-to use, use item to use, huh? His item magic worked with rituals that stored it into items to be used later. I see. So he would take his magic and put it into these devices. Hockey stick stave may have been a cheaper TV replacement to avoid CGI explosions. Could be. And as I recall, it was set in Chicago and being a Blackhawks fan myself. And, and knowing how big hockey is as a Chicago sport, I'm not surprised that they would throw a hockey stick in to uh, help endear the audience to the character. It's not a bad idea. In any event, we will uh, jump back in next week with more on uh, rods, actually getting into the individual rod descriptions. And uh, we'll leave it at that for this week and say... Thank you very much, and thanks for uh, bringing up Dresden. That's a that's an excellent touchstone, and one that I was aware of, but had uh, forgotten I was. Much appreciated. Where are we at here? There we go. Well, that is to say, this has been the OK Grognard Show. We've been looking at the first edition, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons Dungeon Master Guide section on magic items. This was part 11. We discussed rods, staves, and wands overall, and we'll get into individual descriptions of rods next week. 
and I'll just have to say thank you to everybody and we'll start also with thanks to the, everybody in the chat and thanks to everybody who chimed in and thanks to everybody in particular Sarah for chiming in we'll say the show streams live on Twitch each Monday at 10 a.m. Central and then is archived on YouTube if you uh, join us on Twitch which we hope you do then please do subscribe to the channel follow the channel and uh, chime in on the chat when you're in here because it's always enjoyable to have a little back and forth if you're catching up with us on YouTube by all means subscribe click the little bell so you get updates anytime we upload a new video give us a thumbs up on any videos you like and enjoy and please do comment if you have some constructive criticism or friendly information to share it's very much appreciated thanks to our patreon supporters links are provided in the show notes tom tullis of fat dragon games rick hershey of fat goblin games carlos lysing of castle entertainment heath farnden of the nipd and d20 dave o'brien of four quacks games and of course as always shane bradley dm extraordinaire this has been the ok grognar show Coming to you from beautiful Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Bye-bye.